Hey, welcome back to Guided Hacking, and in this video, we'll be learning about arrays. An array is defined by the type's name, the variable's name, and its size. This type name could be a struct type too, because in C, you can have arrays of structs. So we'll start by looking at an example, assume that we have an array of the int data type of the size six. And as you may already know, array indexing in C starts from zero. So the first element here is the zeroth element, and then it goes up to five. Now this variable is a pointer and it points to the first element of the array. If we dereference it, we will get the value of the element at the zeroth index. Now that's out of the way, we can assume that we have this array with the following elements. We're assuming that this array is allocated at the address hex a thousand to make calculations easier. And as we know, the variable just contains the address of the first element, so both of these mean the same thing. In order to understand the assembly level details, let's learn about calculations first. So what do you think the address of ARR1's first element will be? If you watched the previous videos, you'd know that it's going to be hex 1004 because the first integer will take four bytes. We could use this to find a general formula for the address of the nth member of the array. We can now look at the second element and its address is now hex 1008 as expected. Thus, for any array of any arbitrary type of any variable size, the address of the nth element will be at the address of the first element, summed up with the size of the type multiplied by n. Today's video was sponsored by Malcorda. IO. Scanning files for unknown threats has become essential, yet the steps to accomplish this remains complex and demanding of resources. Malcor provides a new approach to malware analysis. It was designed to automate this process and all of it can be done online within a sandbox which is able to process samples within seconds. Malcor hunting allows users to look for threat intel. Users will be able to hunt by providing the IP address or Yara rule. Malcor also provides a number of scan options to run on uploaded files. Standard scans include the ability to check for false similarities using code reuse, there's an option to analyze domains, and you can also perform analysis on an executable. Pro scans allow you to perform a binary diff onto binary files, and there's also an option that gives you access to Malcor's threat feed and allows you to gather data from it. But those are only some of the options, there are many more that you can choose from to fit your needs. Malcor offers affordable account options for you to choose from that would best cater to you. Different tiers gives you different file upload allowances, hunts, and scans. But you can start by signing up for a free account today at malcor.io. So let's use this with our current array to find the address of the fourth element in this array. We know that the starting address is hex 1000 and the type is int and n is 4. Thus we get hex 1000 plus 16, which is hex 1010, and that's what we get. So now we're going to look into about how this is actually useful for reading assembly code related to arrays. So we're going to assume that, again, we have the same array and this function operates on it. The assembly of the function looks like this, assuming that the starting address of the array is stored in the RBX register. And now we're going to read it line by line. The first line moves the value 5 into the address pointed by RBX as shown in the corresponding C code. The next two lines move the value 5, which is now stored at the address pointed to by RBX from the first line into the RBX register and then moves it into RBX plus 12 because when we look at the C code, it's moving the array zeroth element into the third. And if we calculate the address, that will be required using that formula. It's going to be RBX plus 12, which is what we see here. For that last line of code, the first instruction moves RBX plus 12, the array's third element into RAX, then shifts it left by one. What this instruction is going to do is the equivalent of multiplying a number by two. Then it's moved into the array's fourth element. Now we're going to look at another example that's a bit more complex and more realistic to what you'd see in the real world. You may usually have a loop like this, which fills the array with subsequent values or calls a function on them. This function just fills every element of the array with a number from one to six. The assembly with this function looks like this, but don't get overwhelmed. We're going to go over it one by one. First, this is just setting up the values of the RBX register for I and the RCX register for J with the value zero and one. Also remember that the RDX register contains the base address of the array. In the next block, the first thing it does is check if RCX is greater than or equal to six which is just a way to check the loop condition, which is i is less than six. If that is true, the loop ends as it should. In the next line, it's doing a calculation, which is just the formula we discussed earlier to find the nth element of any array. Let's rename these things so they are a bit clearer. Here, the size of int is already put by the compiler as a constant, then the value of n is that of i because we're accessing the ith element of the array, and we already know that rdx is the base address of the array, so we have that here. So this instruction basically calculates the address of the ith element of the loop and saves it into R8 
then moves the value of RCX, which is J, into the address pointed to by R8. The brackets in the move instruction are used for dereferencing. So if you can understand this looping pattern, you will never have a hard time understanding assembly code which have arrays. So we're now going to learn about multidimensional arrays and to make it easier to understand, we're going with a two-dimensional array. A two-dimensional array is basically a matrix. It can be thought of as an array of arrays. The M here represents the number of rows, which are horizontal, and N represents the number of columns, which are vertical. Now let's look at this example where this piece of code defines a two-dimensional array with three rows and two columns, which basically translate to three arrays of a maximum size of two so the total element stored will be two times three which is six and so we'll fill the arrays with the values from one to six and visually it'll look something like this or better like this as we said earlier it's an array of arrays now again the variable itself contains a pointer to the first element of the first array and we assume it's allocated at the address hex a thousand now to read the assembly and to understand how it works we need to learn address calculation for two-dimensional arrays too it's basically the address of the start of the array added to to the size of the type of the array multiplied by the row that we want to get to and the total number of columns plus the column that we want to get to. Let's evaluate this for the first element of the first array. Since we assume that it's allocated at hex 1000, we have that out of the way. And then we already know that the size of int is four bytes, so we put four here. Now we're looking in the first row, so we put one there and then the number of columns in this case, as you can see, is two, so we use that. And then our column number is one, two, so we put that here. After evaluating this section, we get four times three, that's 12. We add that to get hex 100C, and remember that is the base address plus 12 for later. Now the assembly code for this is quite simple. We move each of these values to their corresponding places, assuming that RBI contains the address of the starting array. In memory, there's just one after another, so the address calculation, as you may have seen in the previous videos, is just adding the size of the data type to the subsequent memory addresses. Usually when you're reverse engineering, you don't often get what you're seeing on the left. We more often see what's on the right. It usually loops, which it fills the array with some sort of data. In this case, this function goes over every element in the two-dimensional array and fills it with the numbers from one to six. The total number of elements is six in the three rows and two columns of this array. And the assembly for these loops is also different as you can see on the right. So the R8 and R9 registers are zeroed, which are just the loop variables I and J. And R10 is K is set to one, which is the value which will be put in the arrays. We'll take a look at the next block of code, which compares R8, which is I with three. And if it's greater than or equal to that, it jumps to the code with the loop ends. If it's not greater than or equal to that, then it goes in the inner loop where R9, which is J, is compared to 2, and if it's greater than or equal to 2, the value of I is incremented. This is the loop condition that we have in the inner loop. Now to understand the calculations that the LEA instruction is doing, we need to bring back the formula that we use to calculate the addresses of the elements in a 2D array. We need to go right to left to evaluate this. So first we know that M is I in this case because that describes the row we want to access, and N is J because it's the column we want to access. So we replace them in the formula and the two that you see is the number of columns which the compiler has hard-coded. So the first instruction just calculates m times the number of columns plus n and saves it into r11. If we look at the next instruction we're going again from right to left so the four that you see is the size of the array's type which is integer. r11 is the result of the previous instruction and rbx is the base address of the array. So these two instructions essentially just do this calculation to find the address of the ith rows jth columns address and then store it in r11. Now the value stored in r10 which is the value of k is moved into the address pointed to by r11 which is the same line as this code and then the registers are updated and the loop continues until the requirements are met. And that's it for this video. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you again next time.